everybody. So today we're going to be doing section 4.3, which is about soil composition and properties. The learning objective for today is that you can describe similarities and differences between properties of different soil types. You're going to learn about the water holding capacity of different types of soil, how the particle sizes and composition of soil can impact various factors, different ways that we can test soil, and tools that we can use to kind of determine what our soil is made up of. Okay, so we're going to be looking at the soil particle size, texture, and porosity. So if you remember in our 4.2 notes, we talked about how we have geologic portions of soil, which is made up of rock or rock that has been weathered down. And then we also have the more biological part. And we are going to be focusing on the geologic, the rock portion of soil for this. So when we have our rock slowly weathered throughout time and we get different types of soil. If you look here on the side, we have from biggest to smallest is sand and then silt and then clay. And so this is going to be based on the size of the particles. Now, because sand is bigger, it has bigger pores and bigger pores mean there's more empty space in between the particles. So if you look here, the sand has more empty space compared to the clay that's all tightly packed together. Now this is important because bigger pores allows air and water to enter the soil, the sandy soil really easily. Now because clay has the smallest pores, it's actually harder for air and water to enter soil that is pretty clay heavy. And this is going to have an impact on water retention and the fertility of the soil. Now, when we are looking at soil texture, it's gonna be determined by the clay, sand, and the silt percentage. And it's always gonna add up to 100%. So for example, 40, 40, 20, um, we're gonna have the proportions of each of these three, and that adds up to 100% to tell us what the soil texture is. So I'm gonna show you how we can determine soil texture. And it's using something called a soil texture chart. And you can use this, it's also called a soil triangle. You can use the soil triangle to determine the soil texture. So for example, if we were to take a mason jar, mix it up with water and soil, let it all kind of settle overnight, you would actually be able to see the three different layers of clay, silt, and sand. So for this particular example here, if you went and measured it and did the math, 45% of this would be sand, 35% of it would be silt, and 20% of it would be clay. Now, we don't talk about soil in these different percentages. We talk about kind of the type of soil that it is. And you can use these percentages to determine the soil texture. So I'm gonna show you how to use this with this soil triangle that we have here. So if we have 45% sand, we start down here, 45 is right about there. We go up, then we go to where we have 35% silt, which is up there. And then we are going to have the 20% clay, which is going to be right there. So if we look at this purple part here, it is going to be loam. So this example test right here, the soil texture is going to be loam. I realize I just did that quickly, but I'm gonna walk you through how to actually use a soil texture chart. So you're gonna always start on the bottom with the percentage of sand. So always start here. So you're gonna move up. So let's say we're looking at this like 40, 40, 20. We'll follow the red line. You start at sand, you go diagonally up the triangle here, and then we are going to have silt. You go straight from where the sand and silt meet. So we went up diagonally here. Now you're going to go diagonally straight to this percentage of silt, which is 40. Where those two meet, then you're going to go straight over to the clay. And a tip is to make sure that it always adds up to 100%. If you add it all up and it's not 100%, 
then you did it incorrectly. So I'm going to give you a chance to um, practice Oh, sorry, forgot a couple clicks there. So now we're gonna practice. <laughs> Where you see this blue circle right here, I want you to find the percentage of sand, silt, and clay of this blue circle right here. So I'm gonna have you pause the video, figure out those percentages before I give you the answer. Okay, so hopefully you pause this, and this is going to be the answer of the blue. We're gonna first start with sand and you if you go there it's 30 percent is going to be that diagonal that you go up then we are going to go to the silt which is going to be 20 percent is where those two connect then we go straight over to the clay so it would be 30 20 sorry 30 percent sand 20 percent silt 50 percent clay you add that all up, it adds to 100. So we did it correctly. So now I'm going to talk about um, porosity, permeability, and water holding capacity and why this even matters. So porosity is going to be the pore space within a soil. And as I talked about, more sand means it's more porous because those particles are going to be bigger. So they are going to have more pore space in between the different particles. Permeability is going to be how easily water drains through soil. The higher porosity you have is going to be the higher permeability that you have. Now, the water holding capacity is how well water is retained or held by soil. The more porous or permeable, it's going to have a lower water holding capacity. So water is going to be able to drain, but it's going to keep draining straight on through. It's not going to be held in that soil. And the reason that this matters is this actually has an effect on the soil fertility. So soil that is going to be too sandy, too permeable, is going to drain water way too quickly for roots. And those roots are going to dry out, and then the, soil, the plant is going to die, which means the soil is not very fertile for that plant. But on the other side, if we have too clay heavy soil, remember that clay is going to be really tightly packed so you don't have much porosity, and which means you don't have much permeability. So this means that it doesn't let water drain. So you are going to either have it so that the water doesn't even get in, or if that water does get into the clay, it's actually going to not drain and the roots are going to become waterlogged. It's going to suffocate them because they're just sitting in water, which is also going to cause your um, plant to die. So the most ideal soil is going to be loam. And loam is going to be this balance between those. Loam is going to be, remember, it's about 40, 40, 20. And so you are going to have this balance of sand and clay to where it's going to have enough pores that water can get in and be held, but it's also going to be big enough that it will also kind of slowly drain out so that the plants can get that water and have some of it, but it's not going to become waterlogged. So that's why loam is going to be this ideal for soil fertility. Now, soil fertility um, is going to be the ability of soil to support plant growth. And there's going to be a couple different things that relate to how fertile this soil is gonna be. And the first one is gonna be nutrients, things like um, nitrogen, potassium, calcium, magnesium. And these are all gonna be necessary for plants to grow and survive. And so we're gonna look at some factors that can increase soil nutrients. This is gonna be stuff like organic matter. And remember that organic matter is gonna be broken down into humus. Humus is going to hold on to this nutrient and slowly release it in the soil so that plants can have access to it. Now, additionally, it's going to be beneficial to have some clay in there because if you notice these nutrients that I listed, a lot of them are positively charged. Clay is negatively charged, which means that these positively charged ions are going to bond to the negatively charged clay and it's going to kind of hold these nutrients into the soil so that they're available for those plants. 
Additionally, um, if you have things like some calcium carbonate, which can come from limestone, this is going to be a base and it's going to help make sure that your soil does not get too acidic because really acidic soil is also not going to be good for plants. So bases like calcium carbonate are going to help with balancing that and making sure it doesn't get too acidic. Now factors that are going to decrease soil nutrients are going to be um, acids that are leaching in or too many positively charged nutrients. These are going to lead to acidic soil, which I just said is not good for plants. Additionally, if you have excessive rain or irrigation, this is also going to leach nutrients because it's going to be washing those nutrients away. Excessive farming also is going to be depleting nutrients because you're going to be growing so many crops that it's going to be using up all of these nutrients that are in the soil. Additionally, topsoil erosion. If we're removing that layer of topsoil, we're removing a lot of that organic material that ultimately is going to create humus, which, as I said, is going to be very nutrient heavy. So when that topsoil erodes, that is going to lead to decreased nutrients in the soil. Now, the other side of soil fertility is going to be water. Remember that I just said that you need to hold water, but not too much. You don't want it to become waterlogged. So factors that are going to increase the water holding capacity is going to be aerated soil from biological activity. Things like um, organisms digging up soil or root going in and kind of breaking that soil up and pushing it around. An increase in compost, humus, and organic matter is going to increase the holding capacity of water. Clay content is also going to increase it and root structure, especially natives that are going to go deeper down into the soil. Those roots are going to be kind of breaking up the soil, causing little pockets of air, and that's going to help with holding capacity of water. Then factors that decrease water holding capacity is gonna be compacted soil from like machines or cows or humans walking around and packing it down. That's going to compress it. It's going to take out some of that, um, the pores, which is going to make it so that there aren't pores to hold water. We also have topsoil erosion, which I just explained. That's also gonna decrease holding capacity. If it's too sandy or if you're having root loss, that's also going to lead to problems with water holding capacity, which is ultimately going to impact the fertility of that soil. Now, these are going to be ways that soil quality can be tested. And there's a few different ways that you can test soil. The first one is just kind of what I showed you with the mason jar where you let it settle in a jar of water. You can look at the three layers and you can determine how porous or permeable soil is gonna be based on the percent of sand, silt, and clay. So the permeability is gonna be the time that water takes to drain through a column of soil. And you can actually like take your soil and pour water on it and see how long it drains. You're going to want to have a control group when you do that test, but you can see how permeable it is. We can also test soil pH just using a simple pH strip so we can tell how acidic or basic it is. Remember that more acidic soil is not going to be good for plants. It's going to have less nutrient availability. So you want it to be um, not too acidic and you can use a pH strip to test that. Additionally, you can look at the color. Remember that humus is going to be darker, so the darker it is, the more nutrients and moisture that we are going to have in it. And then you can also test different nutrient levels, measuring things like ammonium, nitrate, potassium. Remember that higher nutrient levels are going to mean more plant growth. Lower levels could indicate that it's either acidic soil or that it's being depleted. Now, this is actually going to be really important for farmers. Farmers are constantly testing their soil quality and seeing if they have certain, certain nutrients that they're maybe lacking. Additionally, um, homeowners will just do this in their yards to find out, for example, if you want to grow blueberries, blueberries actually prefer a slightly more acidic soil than grass might prefer. So you might use pH strips to test the soil so that you can know if you should add something to it to make it more beneficial for growing those blueberries versus if you're trying to grow grass you might add something to make it a little bit more basic so it's not as acidic. I actually have done this soil testing on my yard to figure out how to help certain things grow that I want to grow in my garden. So knowing how to test these is actually going to be 
really important. I paid somebody to do this for me. I wish that I had known all of these things because I could have done it myself. So maybe one day you will get the opportunity to do that in your own garden or lawn. So this is going to be your practice FRQ for 4.3, where you're going to be practicing the skill of describing an aspect of a research method, design, and or measure used. So what I want you to do is to identify and describe one test that can be conducted on a soil sample. And I want you to explain how the results of the test could allow you to give advice to a farmer trying to grow crops in that soil. So that's going to be your practice FRQ for 4.3, and those were your 4.3 notes.